meters away. I'm going to have to use my big voice. Shall we all, um, shall we start? We know that Auckland has started and I don't think Ray will um, be longer than me, so I should probably get onto it so they're not waiting to hear Sam's speech next. <laughs> um, I'm Vicky Cooksley, president of ETNZ. For those of you that don't know me, I think I know most of you in the room. Um, I'm a Wellington-based contractor of... Um, Management and technical services is probably the easiest way to explain it these days. Uh, so welcome, welcome to our first Rigged Safe seminar. We've had a much bigger uptake than we ever expected. Um, Sam kind of suggested this on the back of USITT's, yeah, it's your fault, um, USITT's initiative, which is the 28th of April. Um, they call Rigged Safe Day in the States and celebrate it, so we're trying to adopt it too. Um, and we started with just doing this in Wellington. Auckland jumped on and said we want to do it as well. And since then, um, we've got two live centres here in Auckland. And we're also live streaming the three presenters to 10 other centres around the country. So that's pretty impressive, actually. Pretty, it's, it's exciting. It's great. Um, and if this works, we might use this as an initiative to get more out to the regions and do uh, this a bit more. Uh, so some quick housekeeping. I don't know how many of you guys uh, know the ballet studios. So if we do need to leave, if we hear an alarm or anything, we go out these doors. If you go right, there's a stairwell that goes downstairs. You then get into a corridor which takes you out to the back of the St. James. We assemble in the car park. If you can't get down that one, go out that door again, go left. There's another stairwell down the other end which also takes you downstairs and out the back door to the car park. Um, earthquake, drop cover hold, standard, and then we'll wait for someone, Andrew maybe, or me, to make a call about whether we stay in the building or leave. Uh, if you need bathrooms, out these doors again to your left, the male's one's quite close, the female one is the door right past all the dressing rooms, so don't get put off. It's locked. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the housekeeping. Cool. So, my little clicker thing. You have to excuse me. I'm not used to standing up here. It's becoming a bit of a regular occurrence. Um, so, moving on, uh, tonight we've just got a series of quick fire presentations. I'm going to do a very quick ETNZ update on where we're at ahead of this year's conference and AGM. Um, Sam is then going to give you an update on our rig guide, um, an update and a review of that. Uh, we've then got uh, Mark from WorkSafe, who is going to do a quick presentation around the Health and Safety and Work Act 2015 and hazardous work notifications that I know a lot of us um, have to deal with occasionally. Uh, and then we've got Wolf uh, from Cooks, who's going to um, step us through some hardware inspection and disc card criteria. And then leading on after all of that, we'll have a really quick question and answer session. Um, we do want to wrap this up by nine o'clock, but um, I'm happy to also, going on the next part of how we all kind of network and group, uh, find a close by pub and have a beer somewhere. I don't know where that might be. So uh, jumping on to my little update, uh, we had a face-to-face -face meeting the other day as the executive, so everything's quite up to date at the moment. Um, we've got the conference this year here in Wellington, 4th and 5th of July, with some professional development sessions in the days leading up to that. Uh, there's a selection of interesting seminar sessions lining up. Uh, I'm sure some of you will be tapped on the shoulders to uh, participate in those sessions. Uh, and I was hoping that we might have some updates on this exciting keynote speaker, uh, presenter, um, but we're definitely in conversations with a very exciting um, organisation um, to bring a keynote speaker into the country. I'll just leave it at that. But um, 
if it, if it all comes off and all the ducks line up properly, it's, it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, professional development sessions. Uh, I can't actually tell you what they are. Sam, there's an EWP session in the list. There's a rigging one. Yeah. Fire extinguisher training, yeah, and and uh, some fire water warding training as well. I'm sorry, I registered the conference myself last night. I should have paid more attention to what I was reading on the website. Um, I've got a brilliant subcommittee that looks after organising that, so I don't get too involved in all that detail. Um, moving on, uh, we're moving forward quickly with a new membership structure for the organisation. Um, as long as the membership you guys approve it in, at the AGM, um, but we, introduce, we want to introduce a grassroots uh, membership level, which is at the bottom. It's a free level and it's to try and capture all those other technicians and casuals that are out there in the market that actually can't afford for a membership right, pay for a membership right now, but they'll, just, they'll, they'll get the newsletter and at least we can get information flowing out to them, um, and that helps us on many fronts. Um, and we're looking at splitting the company level into two so that um, the smaller companies uh, around the country can afford to have a company membership as opposed to lots of individual memberships. So it's pretty exciting. Um, we're also looking at lots of great benefits to go with all those new tiers um, and hope to introduce that um, properly at conference for everyone. Um, along with hopefully a lineup of discounts from suppliers and the likes depending on what membership tier you're sitting at. Um, new qualifications, um, they don't feel that new anymore to me. I think I've been working on them for about five years with a large group of people. Uh, we are getting closer. Um, the Minister has just given Skills Active um, the, the suite of performing arts to develop, so they've got the official tick to, to work with all the performing arts suites. And we're currently waiting for the final tick from NZQA on the graduate profiles. Um, they came back to us about six weeks ago with some really minor questions, so it's sitting on someone's desk in a government department just waiting for that rubber stamp. Um, and at the moment, the level four unit standards are out for consultation. They're out till next week. Um, so it'd be great if you can have a look at those and feedback. We are an industry that has actually fed back more into the qualification development than many other industries out there in this country. So it's pretty impressive for an industry that is actually so small. Um, so please, if you can, take time to feedback on those unit standards. All feedback is welcome, good and bad. If you don't like them, tell us that because then we've done something wrong and we need to relook at what we've written. Um, yeah, and if you don't know how to get to those and you want to have a look, just um, come and see me. And then uh, the review of the rig guide. Sam is going to speak more about this, but um, I believe that that team has um, started a, a review on that document. Um, but I will let Sam go into that. So Sam Johnston, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. And Gibbo in Auckland. It's got my name on it. Uh, good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, which is a few of you, um, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a member of the ETNZ Exec Committee and a contributing uh, contributor to the RIG Guide. Um, we had a meeting, much like the ETNZ Executive, last just recently about the RIG Guide uh, to cover where we're going with it. So a bit of a background for those of you who don't know much about it. It's, um, the RIG Guide is a document that was, present, that was created and issued by ETNZ for its... Um, for its membership as a bit of a, to try to get a bit of consistency. So it was started in Wellington, uh, we were finding a bit of inconsistency around some venues and we wanted something to be able to refer to as a New Zealand type of element. Um, it got a lot of interest throughout the country and so we it expanded to be an ETNZ thing. Um, the first draft was released in 2013 and after a feedback period we actually launched a, a formal document uh, at conference 2015. Um, it was due for review last year, we sort of nudged it out to this year because it was relatively current still. Um, we have started the process. Uh, so the contributors for the rig guide, Andrew Gibson, who's not here because he's doing this in Auckland at the moment, um, and telling me I need to hurry up already, the joys of technology. Um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, James Killen and Steve Sanders, uh, who are 
um, a very key part of it, essential in the development. And this year we welcome Nick Creech to the rigging guide as well. Um, so a lot of you will know Nick, he's a, currently a consultant, a consultant on aerial acrobatic rigging for Cirque du Soleil, but um, he's based here in Wellington and he travels around doing some good stuff with that. So he's got a lot to offer um, in his knowledge, particularly around the um, fall arrest and the human element of uh, entertainment rigging. Um, we are aiming to have a draft version of the, of the version two out for consultation at this year's conference in July. Um, so some of the items that we've already identified and had feedback to us that we're looking to change in this year's guide, um, there's some formatting errors or documents that are done in a hurry, have them. Uh, our one has quite a, a good chunk, so we've got some of them to fix. Um, we've got a, some outdoor structures have received a bit of feedback. Um, building consent, there's a bit of variation and confusion by people what's required for building consent for, uh, for truss structures and rigging. Um, full protection, this is where Nick's really going to come into his own. Um, updating the health and safety section to ensure it's current and, and relevant and, and evolving in a pragmatic way for the industry. Um, creating more information around redundancy and design and redundancy factors in general in rigging um, and to try to pad out some information, get more information in there that's relevant to us in the glossary and, and, and getting a consistency of information flow. Um, in general, you know, we, we need the membership to be able to feed back on this. If, if it's five people sitting around a table writing a document, it's not a nationwide document. Um, everyone does things a bit different and it's got to be something consistent. So we do request that the membership take time to review the guide. They send back some constructive and useful feedback that we can work with um, and to, to help make it um, evolve and develop into something really useful. Um, so we've got in the two live venues and hopefully in some of the other venues around the country there'll be a feedback uh, page, jot some notes if you've got anything that jumps to mind that you'd like to know about um, or to be included in that document um, or flick an email to one of us. Um, and if you haven't seen the guide it's available as a free download off our website. So um, it's quite a good little thing, it's uh, a good little book, it's got some great maths and really good useful practical ways of doing things and rigging and some good information. So it's well worth um, you know, having as a reference document just lying around. Um, and that's me, short and sharp, Gibbo will be proud. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, the next presenter. So uh, the next presenter is Mark Donoghue, he's from uh, WorkSafe New Zealand and he's going to be... Uh, uh, entertaining us incredibly well on the Health and Safety Act. Sorry to set you up like that, Mark. Cheers. G'day, everyone. Uh, just bear with us while I get the technology sorted. And uh, so here we go. Oh, yeah. that'll, ah, that'll do it. Okay, g'day everyone. So look, um, as, uh, as Sam said, I'm Mark Donoghue from WorkSafe. I'm an, uh, an assessment manager and an inspector with WorkSafe uh, Wellington office. So look, tonight I'm going to give you a few simple pointers on the, um, the Health and Safety at Work Act uh, and then run you through the notifications process. Now there's, there's two areas of the notifications process, one being notifiable events, one being notifiable work, or hazardous work as it's known. But firstly, the Health and Safety at Work Act, and uh, we, we more affectionately refer to it as HAZWA, mainly just because it's easier to say. Um, and we know the Act has caused quite a stir since it uh, came into effect in April last year. Um, it's not really a bad thing when you consider New Zealand's relatively poor health and safety record. Um, and we kind of think it's time for us to start working together with industry to see how we can improve that record. So just, you know, just to give some perspective, um, some of the research shows that smaller businesses are less likely to think uh, that someone's going to get hurt at their place of work. Um, the data actually suggests otherwise and that they're by no means immune. And some figures on that, and in, the, in, the, in the year to March 2015, um, for New Zealand's 150,000 or so smaller businesses, uh, being micro, small to medium type businesses, there were the equivalent of um, over a thousand ACC claims per week. Now that figure, um, that figure includes severe fatals and non-severe um, accidents, and it gives you a bit of a sense of the scale of the problem that we've got ahead of us and what we're trying to achieve. 
So in terms of the act itself, I've got a couple of key messages for you that may help. Hopefully I'm not telling anyone how to suck eggs here, but um, you know, breaking it down to um, you know, a couple of key points. It's not about, I mean, good health and safety isn't about piles, and piles of manuals and paperwork gathering dust on the shelf. Um, we're not interested in that. It doesn't have to be as hard or as complicated or as expensive as some might suggest. And it's about first understanding the risks specific to your business and starting with what could cause people serious injury, illness or even death. And what those risks look like are going to vary by the business, vary by the work that business does and uh, where you're doing it and the people involved. I know the rigging game's full of hugely competent and experienced um, people um, and, it's, and it's, it's not heavily regulated, probably for that reason. But it's when things change or when other people are affected by the work or involved in the work that things can go a bit pear-shaped. The next thing, next key message is about managing risks proportionately. We're not interested in people trying to eliminate every risk at any cost. That's not what it's about. Relatively low-level risks it will have fairly simple and straightforward and effective methods available for managing them. But the greater the risks and the more likely they are to happen, then the more vigilant the health and safety practices need to be and will be expected to be. So what we're looking for, if we turn up on site or are talking to people, is we're looking for evidence that you're engaging um, with the business and other businesses that that you work with, that you're talking about the work involved in that business practice, that you've identified and you understand the risks associated with the business or the work that you're doing, and that you have effective processes in place to minimise those risks, and that's if you can't eliminate them. You also need to think about getting the workers involved so they understand those risks well enough, and that you need to make it easy for them to talk about them but also feed back on those risks and any improvements that could be made. Um, we've seen some fantastic examples recently where businesses have adopted some of the key concepts of the Haswell legislation, and a good number of those examples are based on simple improvements in communication around the work. Communication between the business and the workers involved in the work or contractors that they might be subbing the work out to or get also getting involved in the work, or may be affected by the work. So good examples of things like um, regular meetings with workers at a site may not be easy for you guys, but toolbox talks, project pre-start meetings and, uh, and review works um, of any incidents or near misses involved in a bit of work. Um, some, of those, some of those meetings could include a discussion with the contractors about their competence, who's going to be involved, whether they're the right guys to do the work in the first place but basically getting through the specifics involved in that work. Um, and, even, and just as importantly, if the plan for getting that work done changes, it's reviewing that plan with the people involved or affected by it. Seminars like this are another great way to communicate with people, and we're seeing a lot more of them, or we're just being invited to a few more of them, who knows. So that's it about the Haswar Act. We're going to get on to notifications. Uh, and the two, the two sorts that we're interested in, as I said, notifiable events and notifiable work. As you can see on the slide, there's a couple of, um, there's timescales for completing those notifications. Um, but can anybody tell me what a notifiable event might be? I'm not interested. Serious harm? Yep, yep. We're not, really, we're not really using serious harm anymore. That's a term from the, um, from the Health and Safety and Employment Act, but you're exactly right. What's actually happened since Haswar is a couple of the details around serious harm or severe injuries have changed a little bit, and I'll go through that in a bit. But you're, you're absolutely right. Um, anyone else? Anything else? Yeah? That's a good one. <laughs> That's another good one. Uh, whether, it, whether or not it causes industry, it might be an uh, injury, it might be an event rather than uh, harm as such, but yep. Um, let's go through this and have a look at the website. There we go. Now, I've been used to using a mouse, so bear with us while I uh, have a crack at this trackpad. Here we go. 
Okay, so the website's fairly straightforward, more so when you're using a mouse. Um, and what we're looking at is notifications, notifiable events. Our website has had a lot of investment and improvement. It used to be a bit of a pain and it's, um, it's getting a bit smarter, but um, ultimately it's down to the user, isn't it? All right, bear with us. Okay, so a death, a notifiable illness or an injury, well, that's a bit vague, um, and a notifiable incident, which could be a scaffold collapse. Uh, also things like containment issues with a hazardous substance, and it's mainly um, used by major hazard facilities for containment or process issues. Um, so the top two, death and injury and illness, are going to be relevant to, uh, to you guys, I'd imagine. Now, if we want to know a little bit more about those, because change is always at a bit of complication, there's a, quite a useful tab-based tool on our website that gives a bit more guidance. So a death, fairly straightforward, get on the phone. An injury, what sort of injury? What do we got? So we've got amputations, serious head injuries, serious eye injuries. I won't go through them all, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because the tool pretty much does it. Um, there's links to or use the tool to give more information or guidance on whether it is notifiable or to what extent it might become notifiable. And then if you need more guidance, just use the links. Um, if you don't have the website available, Again, it's going to be phoning it in on the 0800 number and guidance can be provided by those guys that will take the call by the call centre. Right, going back to the home page. Hazardous work notifications, that's the next one. Can anyone tell me what we, um, what WorkSafe might want to do with notifications? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's a good call. Here we go. There it is. Okay, so just just to cover this off, notifiable events are covered under HAZWA, Health and Safety at Work Act. Particular hazardous work or notifiable work is covered or still covered under the regulations under HSE, so the, the health and safety and employment regulations. And as you can see on the page, there's some really useful information um, around that if you go to the link. You can go to the regs, you can get a lot more detail, or you can download PDFs, forms. Um, there's a couple of ways you can notify us or complete the notification. As you can see here, you can complete it online Option one. Option two, you can download it, fill it out, post it, fax it, email it. Easy as that. Um, and again, within 48 hours of the intended commencement of the work. So what does the form look like and how easy is it to complete? Let's have a look. In answer to that question about why we need them, it's industry intelligence. Look, I mean, we, we, we don't always work solely based on site visits and investigations into accidents. We want to know about the type of work and the scale of work that's happening in our area or in the country and then decide on whether we've got the resources to be able to work collaboratively in that industry. Yes, we may want to say, well, this is a bit of a special bit of work. We'll go and have a look at that. Or we might want to get a scale of a particular type of work so we can plan our um, engagement or simple talks with an industry. Okay, um, so there's a range of them. Um, if I'm being completely honest, for the amount of notifications we get, we actually go to um, a, a fairly small proportion of them. So the form. Bit more of a pain to complete with a trackpad rather than a mouse, but what you've got is the nature of the work. Now that's a bit of a contentious area because it does on first appearances focus on construction work, or the, and that might lead people to think it's focused on the construction industry. Well, it's, it's not on that industry, it's on the type of work that's outlined in the form and in the, in the regs. And you can see here it covers things like construction type work based on the risk of falling five metres or more. Now that doesn't have to be on a construction site, it could be on any type of site, a manufacturing site, it could be in a warehouse, 
where a piece of work's been undertaken. And the regulations will provide more clarity on them. I've got a copy of them here for discussion if, um, if we need them. But I'm going to try a couple here and I'll, I'll take you through the, the form. Let's say we're going to be erecting a scaffold and also, just to be real flash, on the same day we're going to use a lifting appliance indoors, lifting something over 500 kgs. Where do we go from here? Brief description of the work you're doing. It doesn't have to be chapter and verse. It doesn't. We don't want it to be too onerous on you guys. Um, if we want more detail, we can get in touch. But a brief description of the work so we know what's going on. The location of the work site, city. Now, some of these are on fairly remote sites, so access roads or how we get to the site can be useful. Who's in control of it, whether it's person conducting a business or undertaking, PCBU, or you're a contractor underneath one or a subby. The business name and the industry. Now, you may not like this, but the majority of your work is going to fall into arts and recreation. It is what it is. There's not a huge selection. But that's what you're going to be looking at selecting. Uh, and then again, a bit more detail around your business. Email address, start dates, completion dates. Um, and then the region. If there's a certificate of competence in play for the work that's being carried out, it'd be useful to have that information. It's mostly used for asbestos notifications, if I'm you know, completely fair, but it doesn't mean um, rigging tickets and things can't be included as well. Um, once that's all completed, and I'm hoping you're all quicker typers than me, so it shouldn't take too long, you simply hit continue It'll give you a bit of a readout of what you've put in that notification form for you to make sure it's all there prior to submitting it. So because I haven't filled it out complete, completely, there's a whole lot of red text to say I've missed stuff out. Not unusual for me, but you know, that's what it is. Once you've got all the detail down that it needs, it'll come straight through to us. Um, and then it's logged. That's that's the bit. Now have any of you had a bit of a play on our website recently? Yeah, show of hands. Makes it easier. That's pretty cool. As I say, it used to be a bit of a pain to navigate around. It's a lot better now and there's a wealth of information. Probably not a lot relevant to yourselves or your industry, but there's some great guidance on there, some great general um, work tools and um, and sort of interactive tools that you can use just to get your head around the new act and requirements and things like that. Um, one of the key things that I generally like to refer people to, and let me just get back up and get back to the start, is if you want to know something and, it, and you can't find it on our website or the information doesn't quite cut it, it's as easy as picking up the phone and given us a call on the 0800 number. They may not be able to answer it then and there, but they can direct you to or make a, make a note of your query. And there's an email uh, application or tool available for you to send inquiries through to. And that'll go through, if it's really complicated, and I'm certainly not an experienced rigger, but if it's something technical of that nature, it'll go through to our technical programs and uh, personnel. Um, who have, we've got engineers available, or it'll be forwarded on to a person that can assist and at least respond. And again, all of the main links are available from that first webs, from that first page, as well as the phone number. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Thanks for the opportunity to come along and talk, and I'll be lingering around later for the questions and answers or session later on. Come and have a word. Thanks for your time. Vicky and I were just chatting at the back of the room as to who was going to go up and um, try to find the presentation again. Not that one. Excellent. Look at that. Um, thanks, Mark. It was really good. Um, and having done a lot of those notifications myself, I can tell you that most computers will actually store all your general information in it, so it's auto. So about 90% of those fields are autocomplete after you've done the first couple of notifications. So they do become really quick. Um, so uh, next up, we've got Wilf Milne.
sorry, Rolf Milne from Cooks uh, to talk about hardware. Cheers. That's me. <laughs> okay, hey guys, Wolf Merlin, I'm from Cooks. Um, we want to just look at rigging gear, what to look at, what to look at discarding, and just some general background information on uh, do's and don'ts with rigging equipment. So essentially, when you're using a rigging equipment, you need a periodic inspection. So every so often, it needs to be looked at by a competent person to, to ensure that it's actually good to go so that you, you can qualified to say that hey this is someone's looked at it and it's all good to go but that doesn't stop pre-use inspections so as riggers you guys should be trained and looking at your gear prior to using it so looking at your shackles looking at all your componentry um, give it a quick once over yep that's all good let's go for it So with your, your pre-periodic inspectors, so basically it's deemed by a responsible person. So that's, that's you, that's the user. Um, so you are responsible for your gear. It, it's your life, it's someone else's life. So be careful with it, look at it. If something looks a little bit dicky, look at it again, put it away, get something else in. Then you've got, so that's, that's your day-to-day. So essentially on rigging gear, it needs to be annually inspected by a competent person. So a competent person is someone that's with rigging training, someone that has, um, uh, is basically qualified, that's gone through um, inspection training. So what our competent staff generally do, we are accredited to LEA, which is an international lifting um, organisation in engineering. Um, so they're basically trained and they go through refreshes every six months on componentry. So we look at all your componentry from beginning to end to ensure that every piece works, works together and our disc grade criteria is reasonably strict in a lot of areas. Because we, um, so essentially then, then you'll get that um, looked at every, every 12 months. That's valid for 12 months. So basically what we do is we'll look at it and go, yep, on this day we've inspected it and it's good. Three days time, if that equipment fails, and you've run over it with something like that, that's, that's, that's a responsible person's job to look at the equipment before they use it. But annually, it just gives you peace of mind that it's been looked at independently, and you know that it's all good to go. That's for all lifting equipment. And then your height safety equipment, so your harnesses, any gear you're using for, for jumping up and down and, and height safety and, and rigging, that needs a six monthly inspection. Because there's more life, your life is more involved in it, it needs a stricter criteria. Um, so that's, once again, ideally an independent person or a competent person. Um, competent person are people that are going through training courses, and, but realistically what you need to be looking at is that when, if you are doing it as a competent person, that you record your information. So you record it down, yep, this is what it is, and you need to certify it. So that's where we come on. We've got independent certification. So you can go, here you go. And if WorkSafe come along and have a look at it, you can say, yes, we've had it looked at here. Right, pre-use. Now, this is an interesting picture. So wire rope. Basically, a wire rope is configured and made essentially of uh, a construction of wire rope you'll generally ask is, uh, say, 7 by 19. It'll have two numbers. So your first number is your number of, um, of lay. So, so these here, we call lay, so that would be seven of these on the, on the outside, and then 19 internal strands. So you've got 19, they're twisted together, and then you've got seven lots of 19 twisted on the outside. So essentially the higher the number, so if you've got seven by 24, um, six by 36, so the higher that outside number, the more bend you've got in your rope. So if you want something that's, that's going to twist and bend reasonably easily, you get a higher number configuration. If you want something that's more static and it's going to give you more of a, uh, a stronger length, then you just want a lower number to give you that strength. 
Um, so when you're looking at wire rope, essentially you're looking at um, kinks, twists, all that sort of stuff. We'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, so you need to look at it and see what's, what's safe. Shackles. Everybody uses them, and they're used for all sorts of reasons. You've got two types of shackles. Um, most people are familiar with a D shackle, so it's just a straight U shape, which are good when you're holding bits and pieces together. Um, most people will generally use a, a bow shackle if you're doing any lifting or rigging. Essentially, a bow shackle also uses a wider circumference, so you can fit um, a sling on it, a soft sling, a wire, so it just gives you a bit more room to seat your, your lifting equipment um, to stop it from running around and stop it from bunching up within the shackle itself. Whereas a D shackle, because it's quite narrow, you can bunch up in there, and when your rigging equipment bunches up, it's not really good for it because it's designed to be lifting in a flat, in a, an even manner. When you're discarding a, um, a shackle, so basically it's 10% of allowable wear. So look at it, if there's nicks and things like that, you've got to look at yourself and go, is that 10% of the, of the circumference of it? If it's within 10%, you can still use it. Externally, if it's, if, you, if it's a really big nick out of it, or it's twisted, throw it away. It's not worth using. Just get a new one, and they're relatively inexpensive. So then just look at your, um, your pins. So make sure that they're all seated correctly into your, into your shackle. So when you put it in, it goes all the way to the end of the shackle and it's not moving around inside your shackle. If you're using a shackle on a line that's continu continuously moving, just don't use one of our regular shackles like that, but just seat it into it. Um, then you get a shackle that's got a nut on the outside and a split pin. So hold that in place and it's not going to, the pin is not going to come out and move it around. And once again, just deformation. So if you look at it and you see it's bent or twisted, it's gone. So sheath blocks, you guys use these on a fairly regular basis. So basically, um, you single and double sheaths and you multiple sheaths. So you can get just a sheave ring by itself or a snatch block. So when we talk about a sheave, we talk about the internal part and your snatch block. And essentially, just looking at, so you can get uh, sheath gauges. So basically, just checking on the wear of that sheath. A little sheath gauge can go in there, and you can see it. Um, it shows you the, the diameter of it, and if it sits nice in there, you're all good to go. And you can visually see if, if there is wear in there anyway. So once again, just using the right diameter. So to give an indication of diameter of sheaves, um, if you're using, say, a 7 by 19 construction wire rope, the recommended di minimum diameter of sheave should be 25 times the width of the rope. So if it's a 10 mil rope, 250 mil sheave block. There's a general rule of thumb, um, and then it just works through um, to ensure that it sits and seats properly in there, so that it's not actually jumping out or causing the rope to squeeze, which then causes deformation on the rope, which then you have to discard it. So carabiners, these are ones that most people use. Generally you've got, a, you've, you've got your double action, your single action carabiner which is just your lock in, so it just twists, twists into place and it sits there and it's usually got a little, should have a colour indication to say that yes it's open, yes it's closed. Um, recommended that you use like a double action so it just twists and drops. And then when you, when you close it up, it just locks, locks back into place. So you double or even your triple actions. Um, so basically it just requires more of your thought to actually open it. And then when it clips into place, it stays back in. And you know that you're safe and, and, and ready to go. Um, once again, just like a shackle, just look for deformation and, and twisting. So, who's uh, made up wire rope slings? And you've uh, used um, uh, wire grips or dogs. 
to attach them up. So generally this, your, your layout for, for making up a wire rope, and that's, that's a good way of making wire rope when you're just using it as a, uh, as a tensioning method rather than as a lifting method. So if you're just using it to hold a tension on a unit, then just use your wire rope grips um, just to ensure that, and it gives you uh, a simple way of getting the right length rather than coming and having it made up and you've got to have turnbuckles and adjust it. So your correct method of using essentially is to have all your um, dogs or your wire grips in one, in one manner. Um, so just in through here. Generally, bigger wire ropes will require more um, wire grips, but we've got guides to give you an indication of how many to use and where to use them. Just a, an interesting fact is when you, so a wire rope will have a break strain. So if you're using it as a tensioning thing, so you're working at, in a, in a maximum, maximum break load, so MBL, um, when you do your sheathing, and you run it through, you're going to lose 10% for each one of those that you do. So just take that load off and you know that you're still good in its, in its length and in its, um, in its load that you're, that you're holding into place. Wire rope slings. Here's some interesting uh, little pictures. How many of those have people seen before? Most people have, have, have seen your cork cruiser in a basket shape pink. And there you see that quite a bit. Where it's been flattened, someone's put it on somewhere, there's some weight gone on it, so it's core has been flattened through. Corrosion. Um, corrosion can be dealt with in some ways. Um, Unless it's been um, injected properly, then you'll get into the core. So the wire centre of, of your core, um, that's going to be causing you some grief. So it gets, it gets uh, taken away. Okay, so everyone's probably used a, a staging sling. So your staging sling is basically a wire, wire internal core, which is mostly what you're using. Uh, you also have a, a, a fibre internal core. So where you don't need the heat, heat treatment that a um, wire core offers you, you can use a, a fibre core, which gives you a bit more flexibility. It's a little bit lighter. They're a cheaper uh, unit to use. Um, you just need to be careful. Most of our um, fibre core units will have a twin casing on them now. So they'll have an internal and external casing. So it offers you an extra level of protection on those units themselves. If you find that on a fibre core that you've got a, a hole in your bag, um, if it's on your, on your twin core, if there's a hole in the outside and you can't see any, any of the fibres protruding, um, it's recommended that you just get a, a thread, just stitch it up and you're good to go again. Um, if you do have a fibre unit and you've gone through both layers and you can see some of the actual fibre itself, it's discard, it's gone. Uh, the main reason for that is anything can then get into that fibre and then damage the core inside it, or indeed there could be a stone that's got in there and it's migrated down into the fibre itself. So that's, that's going to give you some grief later on down the track and throw that thing away. Chains, lifting chains. Um, do you guys use much in the way of chain? for lifting. So generally we would recommend that you, a grade 80 chain, which is your minimum grade chain, um, which is an entry, entry level chain itself. Um, now that's, it's, it's a standard chain for, for a lifting industry. Um, we have a range of, of lifting chain which goes from your 80 to a, what's called a 120 grade chain, um, which offers you a smaller diameter of chain with a higher load lift. Um, it comes at a premium, but it, it 
it saves you on some weight. So when you're doing any sort of rigging, you generally look at how heavy you're trying to lift, um, and most things have got a weight, li weight limitation. Um, so grade 80 chain is a good entry level chain, but if you, if you restrict it on weight, then look at using a, a higher grade chain, which you can use a lower um, link size to achieve the same results. Um, once again, um, and, you know, daily inspect your gear before use. Um, just look at all your, all your chain links. Just as a, an easy once over um, and ensure that you're good to go. Once again, those need to be looked annually um, and there should be a current tag on it to say that it has been inspected and its next due inspection is a year's time. Okay, defects. Now, everyone's used a web, a web sling, a tie down, something that's got some webbing in it. We just need to be any signs of fraying. Um, you can have a small amount of fraying through the, through here, but on the edge, if you get any sort of fraying through the edge, it generally should be discarded because that's where the tension is generally taken on that edge through there. Um, you can get a small amount through here, but minimal amount. So if it looks like there's a lot, it's gone. A small amount, you're really good to go. Saves, saves you a couple of dollars. And then once again, if it's incredibly rusty, well, you're probably not going to use it. Um, the top shackle picture just shows some deformation on the pin itself um, for discard. So when you're, when you're putting your loads up, you need, you, you've got to be cautious of weight on all your rigs. Um, so a load cell is a useful piece of kit equipment to um, ensure that your rigging loads are where they need to be. Um, this is one of our, our new one, it's a, it's a blacked one. It's a wireless remote unit, so you put it up with your shackles, you've got your control down here, you can see exactly what it's doing, and you can adjust your load to, to work through there. Just a little bit ourselves. Um, Cooks has been in, the, in, in New Zealand for 105 years, I believe. Um, we started essentially supplying nails, horseshoes, wires to the early settlers. Uh, prior to that time, we, we were an English-based company back then, and our ropes were on the Endeavour. So the company's quite an old, old company. We've gone through a lot of changes. Um, we're now... Uh, focused on rigging, um, hardware, that sort of thing, testing and inspection. Um, to that end, uh, we've got 21 mobile test vans right through the country. Um, so we can get to sites. If you're saying, hey, we need to get someone on site to check our gear, you're, on, you're doing a setup, we can bring a van and look at all your gear, make sure it's all good to go. Um, we've got 12 branches nationwide as well, so we can still offer that same service in branch. Um, 
as part of our uh, demonstration tonight, um, if you do need to buy any gear, 25% off. Nice and simple. Easy enough done. Um, so that's us. Um, I've got some bits and pieces over there. Have a look at a load cell, a sling. Any questions later on, give us a yell. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, all of those presentations were just fantastic. Uh, we're going to go into a question and answer session now, but can I ask that any audience member asking a question um, puts their hand up and Sam will bring you a microphone just so the other centres around the country can actually hear um, the Q&A and learn from it as well. So, any, any questions? Nick? This is for Mark. Um, trying to make the notifications as easy as possible, would it be a good idea to maybe make an app so people could have that on their phone? It would be really easy for people to have um, as opposed to going to a website. So a lot of people are on, on the job now uh, and our phones are a tool that we use every day. Um, so having an app, if, if you don't already have one, having a WorkSafe app for notifying um, for things like that would be super useful. Are you offering? No, nah. uh, I can, yeah, sure, for a fee. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's, it's taken us however many years to get on Facebook and, and find out about things like Twitter and stuff like that. It's a, it's a bloody good idea, and we are starting, we are starting to look more at app-based um, things that we can offer, uh, including risk assessment type um, apps and stuff. Um, maybe just watch the space, but uh, I'll make a note of it because it is a great idea. Um, I know this question has come up before, but um, when it comes to the notifications thing again, we do a lot of, um, oh sorry, this is to Mark. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that we do a lot of lifting inside with um, lifting apparatus and quite frequently go over 500 kgs. So if we're doing a lot of small lifting, is that required as a notification or is it just something we should just do as part of course? If you're talking about small lifting plates less than 500 kg. But with it, yeah, so like say we've got like 20 motors in the air and each one has like 100 kgs, that's like two ton, right? But it's not more than 500 kgs per motor. I mean, the criteria on the notification is, is any lifting for weights over five over 500 kg, so anything under doesn't meet the criteria. Sure. Yeah, even if there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay, mate. Uh, so, uh, in, in theatre setups where there are counterweight sets that can do up to 500 kilos, and perhaps we uh, gang two of them together to lift a 700 kilo load, it's an installed permanent system, is that, does that require notification? <laughs> uh, just for those on the web stream that couldn't see uh, Mark's nod, yep, any movement of anything over 500 kg. Yeah. I mean, you can make it as complicated as you want, but simply if it goes over that 500 kg weight, irrespective of the arrangement, bang, it's notifiable. Sorry. It's good to have clear and clear information. That's good. Just on the um, uh, where it says construction. So if this was like a um, an amusement device, and I know that's a separate sort of field as well. But if you had like a, an amusement thing that people were travelling on, that was say a 500 kilo plus cage that people were sitting in, that wouldn't be included in that because it's not construction. Are you talking about the the the, the so what you're talking about is the appliance that's been lifted isn't relevant to construction work or yeah. at all. I mean, let's say, even say like an elevator, right? So an yeah, elevator yeah. Yeah. would weigh over 500 kilos and yeah. obviously you don't notify when you use that. Yeah. Um, I'll put more context on it. Um, some people sort of look at the work that we do and yeah. struggle to, the, to see it as construction work. Yeah. So they feel that that shouldn't apply to some of the work that we and, do. And it's a really good point um, if, if it helps. I've kind of prepared myself for this. Yeah. Um, 
and, and that, and, and I mentioned it when I was up there before, is that it's, it's, it's not about the construction industry or it being construction related work. Um, it's, the, it's the activity. And if the activity involves construction of something, then, um, that, then it could apply, irrespective of the industry. And if it, and if it helps, I'll, I'll read this out, just because I won't get it right otherwise. Um, construction work by definition under the Health and Safety and Employment Regs, which is where the notification area applies, it's um, any work in connection with the alteration, cleaning, construction, demo, dismantling, erection, installation, maintenance, painting, removal, renewal, or repair of um, any building, chimney, edifice, fence, structure, wall, whether constructed wholly above. You know, so there's a whole raft of stuff, and it's not specific to the construction industry. It's the intent of what we're trying to get is information on a construction-related activity, be it in that industry or not. So it's the activity itself, whether it meets that criteria. And it's really useful to have a, you know, use that link on the website to, to get the definitions. But basically, um, even in the notification form, which I, you know, I've got a printed copy here, it's, you know, it, it doesn't define it by industry or, or, or as such. It's the activity itself. That's what the intention of it's about. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Hello, Mark. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think now. Let's say that, uh, like a school, like a theatre school or something, does a weekly inspection on something, and in that inspection they go over five metres every week. Can they put in a notification that says an open-ended one every week? We do this inspection. Uh, expect that this happens every week uh, until further notice. Can there be some? Could could that be something? If it doesn't exist, that could be put in place because it, the the idea is to make this as easy as possible for people, right? That's how you get people to do stuff. And if you make it hard, people don't do it. So things like that, which make it easy, but give that um, make sure that people are doing the due diligence and doing the notification, but making it so it is an ongoing thing. Do you know that the the, the notification form? Has a um, has an intended start date of the work and an intended end date of that work. Um, now I haven't tested it in anger, personally, um, but it's easy to do for a week or a month or something like that where there's prolonged activity. M my understanding of a really good workaround, because it's a bloody good question and it's a bloody good point, is that for routine activities that are notifiable. You could, if you really like the paperwork, notify each of them, depending on the frequency. One a year works great. But if it's a weekly occurrence, you could dovetail them into a notification that covers a period of a number of weeks. That's my understanding of it. Uh, we're really not going to have too much of a pop at you, uh, you know, if you look at it in that way. The main thing is, is you're notifying, and if we take an interest, we can, you know, we've got visibility. Cool, thanks. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think is there an exemption though under the, the working at height uh, notification for routine work though? For for is, wasn't there a, maybe there, there used to be an exemption for work of a routine nature? Nature. Uh, an exemption. Good, good point. I know that there are exemptions. Yep. Let's have a look. Yep. Uh, something like routine or minor nature, something like that used to be. So exemptions are the requirement. Um, again, looking at health and safety, if it's in an emergency situation, uh, you don't have to notify it. An emergency demolition, emergency lifting, for example. Um, not notifiable because it's an emergency situation. If it's a removal of an injured or, or deceased person, it's not notifiable. Again, falls under emergency. I can't see anything about routine or minor nature yeah. uh, in the notification form, but there might be some more detail in the regs. Yeah, I, thought, I, I thought it was more specifically actually to that working at height one. 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, again, it might have been something that's dropped off, and uh, like a, a case that I'd have would be, say, you're at a theatre where every day you're going up to six metres to focus a light. Yeah. That to me might fall into that routine if this extension exists. That yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's routine work. But say yeah. once a month you go into a theatre, then that's not routine. It's okay. probably going to be those ones that you need to notify, but group maybe yeah. consider grouping because it's routine. Um, in terms of an exemption, whoa, don't know. They do get snuck by us from time to time, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Um, I'll make a note. Mm -hmm. yeah. You happy with me feeding back to Sam on it? Sure. Yeah. I've got a question for Will. Um, we've had some questions sent in before the uh, before the, the event tonight. Um, for a lot of the rigging equipment that we use, uh, it's used on a relatively infrequent basis. Uh, so most of the gear that we that we have probably won't get to the point of worn, uh, unlike a crane lifting operation or anything. Uh, is there a recommended lifespan for any of the equipment that we should consider when it comes to discard? Uh, generally, no. Um, most equipment, um, apart from harness gear um, and height safety gear, um, will generally have depending on where it's manufactured. Uh, height safety gear and it will have either European manufacture, which is a five year um, recommended life if it's uh, manufactured to New Zealand standard and certified to New Zealand standard independently. That's a 10 year life on that, on that piece of equipment simply because um, webbing um, is exposed to UV and other aspects. When it comes to rigging gear, no. There is no uh, recommended life because it's metal. Um, it's generally solid. Um, suppliers will, will, won't give you a, a life expectancy. It does require, though, annual inspection. But apart from that, no. Thank you. Uh, for those on the stream, the, the question was what does the rigging, our rigging guide say about life expectancy? I don't believe we, we approach that specifically. So I'd have to actually go back and, and uh, review, specific, review that, to be honest. Uh, I don't think we you mentioned any life expectancy on any kit. Yeah. But now we will. <laughs> A recommendation. Uh, so whatever the manufacturer's recommendation for that, as soon as you buy something, look at the manual. Like any piece of height safety equipment, there, there should be documentation with it. If there isn't, look it up. If you can't find it, take it back. There should be documentation for everything. Um, on the actual harness itself, there should be a date of manufacture and a date of withdrawal and also a serial number of uh, traceability. If you do buy any harness gear or any height safety gear that doesn't have a date of manufacture and a date of withdrawal, do not buy it, do not use it, because it won't be certified, it won't be qualified. Great. Um, one last chance for any questions out there. Any other question? Yep. So maintenance and repair work of a minor or routine nature where there's a risk of falling five metres or more. You're right, that's an exclusion. Um, we'd have to, you might have to give it some consideration if it's an established routine or if you're erecting something to carry out that routine, it may differ. We may have a different view on it. But you're right, it is in here. Good call. Brilliant. Lovely. Um, so... Oh, slides. We want to say a big thank you, um, one, to um, the audience for, for showing up to our first Rig Safe seminar. Um, it's great. And um, we'd also love a lot of feedback. Um, if you can think of other seminars you'd like to see delivered like this, we'd, we'd love to do those on a reasonably regular basis, maybe three times a year. They take a bit of organising, but um, reasonably pain-free, I think, Sam. <laughs> Maybe. Um, and it's just great to connect, um, great networking event. Um, you're all welcome to hang around, chat, have a chat to hmm? help pack out. Help pack out. 
um, have a chat to, to Mark and Wolf over there. Um, I just, and Mark and Wolf, um, I want to say a big thank you to you. Got a couple of gifts uh, for both of you. If you want to come up here, so everyone can say thank you. Uh, I want to thank you both for giving up your time tonight. Um, it's just been great, and um, I have to say an extra special thanks to WorkSafe for um, it's nice to see the culture having changed and that we have you in a room and have a conversation as opposed to kind of being scared that you might turn up on a work site. So. <laughs> No, it's great, and we'd love to continue conversations as we write these documents and, and make our way through the new act and, and such. So um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to say a big thank you for Multimedia for providing all the equipment and gear, Sam for organising this, and the ballet for providing the location for this tonight. Um, thank you very much. And in Auckland, we've got Auckland Live providing a location as well. In Christchurch, I think we've got the Aurora Centre. Um, so just a big thank you for everyone that has come together to support this. Um, back of the room, we had a sign-in sheet. If you didn't sign in when you came in, please do. Um, we'll keep you up with any extra answers we get. Um, our Facebook page is going to be live for the next 30 minutes as well. So I'll try and negotiate my way through that, which might um, pop up some extra questions which we'll post out to everyone um, and we'd love some feedback on everything um, the rig guide for consultation the qualifications what you'd like to see us doing and what as an organization we can do to support this industry um, and to help grow train and provide a, a great environment for us all so um, Please feel free to feedback. It can be anonymous. There's some more bits of paper at the back of the room, or um, feel free to talk to me or Sam. Yeah. And any feed, um, information to feed into the conference as well. That's me. I'm done. It's enough talking. Thank you.